Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you guys so much for joining. This is our new coach camp, actually just Team Lips Zoom. And we are super excited to really share some valuable information for all of our coaches tonight. The very first thing that I wanted to start with um, saying is, hopefully we are gonna be brief tonight because if you weren't planning on it already, you really should plan on watching Allie's Team Thrive charge tonight at 9 p.m. Um, Sharice shared the link right here on our team page. If you can't watch it tonight for some reason, please put it on your to-do list like as soon as possible. Um, those of us that are in her leaders page got a sneak peek at what is to come. And I'm gonna let her deliver it all tonight, but I'm just telling you it's some very exciting things. Um, I think the Cliff Nose version is she's now a, um, a busy working mom <laughs> and she's had to realize that um, the process needs to be more simple for all of us because our priorities also are our kids and our, and our you know, life. And so um, she's having a mama bear moment and I think it's gonna all be very good and watch that call because there are going to be some changes that are coming down the pipe and kind of along with the lines of what Allison and Sharice and Missy and I have felt that some changes needed to happen to new coach camp and the way our coaches were being progressed through. I think this is going to kind of work straight um, along with, with that. So watch the nine o'clock team thrive charge. Um, Okay, I think that's that was my main, anything else? Okay, so the reason that I've asked Jamie to be on tonight is because um, that's actually kind of came to us, we realized this as we were doing our free group in the Mason Jar Week, and we started sharing about, you know, clean eating in general, and we shared the, the different topics that were in that, um, the Mason Jar Group, and one of the nights was GMO, and we shared the, the GMO information at a very basic level, but we had some really knowledgeable ladies in that group. <laughs> Jamie's one of them with her um, education background. We had some people on um, maybe an opposite side of um, the GMO conversation, and it was all fine. Everything was just very much fine. But we kind of realized that um, if we are going to be um, leaders in our community, if we are going to be sh guiding people to make clean eating and healthy food choices, um, we want to come from a position of value and as much truth as humanly possible. Um, and it can get very overwhelming, the whole topic of clean eating and GMOs in particular have a lot of science behind them. And so as Jamie and I were talking a few weeks ago, um, she, with her background, and I'll let her share that, um, she has knowledge of the science. And so we just thought it would be really valuable because we want to be, we know, we know how valuable Shakeology is for us. And, and many of us have spent a lot of time now studying all of the ingredients and we can say all of those things. We want to be the go-to people for health and fitness and nutrition. And the more um, straight our facts can get, um, the better it'll come across. And, and Jamie, if you want to share a little bit about kind of what some of the stuff you saw um, related to other companies and how that kind of encouraged you to, to you know, talk about this too, that would be great. So with that, I'll give it over to Jamie. You can do a little introduction for yourself. And then um, I'll mute myself. I'm in looking forward to hearing the, what you have to share. And then we'll open it up for questions at the end. Okay? Okay. My name is Jamie Gilbert. I um, teach honors. Right now I teach honors in AP biology at a high school nearby. And um, I guess we kind of, we came into this because as we were preparing for our group, like Jen said, during that week I was crazy busy. and um, one of our team members, you know, said, what should I do with the GMOs? What should I do with the GMOs? And in the busyness of it all, we really weren't able to respond very well to her before she had to post. And then I wasn't able to really, like, I didn't see it until after 
she had posted information about it and I knew that my next door neighbor was in the group and my next door neighbor is actually, um, she's a dietitian, nutrition expert that writes the food labels for Abbott. And she gets very, very passionate about GMOs because of all of the labeling issues. So I quick that night, you know, chatted Jen, I'm like, oh my gosh, we gotta, we gotta shut this down fast because this could get really ugly really fast. But um, because some people get, you know, I've been listening to podcasts about it this week to kind of just get my ducks in a row and everything. And I, and as we know, people get super emotional about food because it means so much to us. So I jotted down some basic things just so we could know because what I'm noticing with some other companies, um, like people try to sell me products and um, there's one in particular where for example, the product is marketed as having an exfoliating shea butter in it. And at first I thought, what? Like shea butter is not an exfoliant. It's a, it's a fat. And um, so I tried the product out and um, I don't really want to like throw any companies under the bus or anything, but um, all of the people, you know, I have had several people reach out to me and they have the exact same marketing tool. They say the shea butter is exfoliating. This is why you experience some of the peeling and things like that. And, and actually I have a family member that sells it to me. So I, I tried the product and um, I guess it's hard to explain without fully like explaining. But so I was told that the shea butter exfoliates your lips. And I thought it was really strange, but in actuality, if you look up the ingredients, it's an alcohol-based product. And so then it dries out your lips and your lips peel. And when people inquire about the, the peeling, you're told, oh, it's shea butter, it's an exfoliant. And shea butter is a fat, it's not an exfoliant, it's, it's a fat. It's, so there's really, you know, so I was worried about, you know, any of us coming forward and saying anything specific about GMOs that might mislead people not that any of us are trying to do that but um especially on the issue of gmos it can get really confusing really fast so i just wanted to be able to give a rundown about these really quick and explain what some of the pitfalls are and maybe some recommendations for like how to respond to questions about it um, i created a couple of pdfs that i sent to jen and one of them is about just some basic information about understanding GMOs. And the other is actually a list of foods that are um, most likely GMOs all the time. So um, it actually came up at dinner tonight because we got out a product that we use all the time. And I looked at it and I thought, oh my gosh, this is crazy. But um, so um, as most of us probably know, GMO stands for genetically modified organism. And so that's any kind of genetic modification that's done in a laboratory setting. And there's several different ways that we can do that. Um, I actually do it with my class. We take um, jellyfish DNA and we splice it into E. coli bacteria, smear it on a plate, and then we can make it glow in the dark. It's really fun. But um, it's, it's really not hard to do. You know, there's different chemicals you mix it with and then you you make it happen i mean it's not it's not difficult but they can do it at really crazy levels in biotech company labs but um they're also called transgenic organisms sometimes you hear that um you also hear about genetic engineering it's all the same kind of thing basically but um just a little background scientists started genetically modifying organisms back in 1974. Um, so um, it, it's kind of interesting because it's been around for a long time. GMOs, now a lot of people that argue against um, like non-GMO things, they will say, well, you know, crossbreeding is a GMO and things like that, which it's crossbreeding and all of those, you know, agricultural ways of raising food and livestock and things like that. It kind of paved the way for a GMO, but Usually when you hear about GMOs, they're talking about in a lab, in a biotech company lab. Um, so the other thing I added was what types of GMOs have been created. 
Um, lots of bacteria with specific features. Animals and plants have been created. Um, a key one, a big one that most of us are probably familiar with is in 1978, they used E. coli bacteria to create insulin for diabetics. That's the Humalog insulin that a lot of diabetics use. So that's a genetically modified insulin. Um, they've also been used to create clotting factors for hemophiliacs, human growth hormone for people with dwarfism, biofuels. Um, so lots of different things. They also um, use, they've genetically modified enzymes that they use to make cheese. A lot of the hard cheeses that we all buy in the grocery store have genetically modified enzymes in them. Um, they also use um, a certain type of pectin, GMO pectin, that um, they use to clarify fruit juices so that they're more clear and shelf stable. Um, in other ways, they've used GMOs to save plants from blight, like tobacco, tobacco blight. China was one of the first countries to um, actually approve the use of GMO tobacco. Um, in, um, shoot, where was it? Papayas. Um, there's a, like a really bad papaya virus, I think in Hawaii. And so they started genetically modifying papayas, crossbreeding them with the, the um, papayas that grow there naturally. And it basically eradicated this virus that was attacking papayas. Um, I know they've also used it with potatoes because of um, like the blight that ruins potatoes and things like that. So I found um, just a couple statistics, like 94% of soybeans are GMO, 96% of cotton, and this is all on the PDF, but um, 93, sorry, 93% of corn, 90% um, of canola oil, 95% um, of sugar beets, 50% of papayas, also potatoes. Um, and the thing that's interesting is when I wrote the list of foods um, on the PDF of foods, I broke it down into like animal products and plant products. But basically any kind of meat that's factory farmed or farm like raised like that, unless it comes from like a small homegrown private farm and that farm will act like they, they you know, will verify that they're grass fed, that nothing's getting cross pollinated or anything like that. Most meat, eggs, milk, um, fish, all of those things end up being genetically modified because they either, um, they either, what about coffee? I didn't even check out coffee. Um, but most of the, um, the meats and meat products are because if they're not being injected with the hormones that are genetically modified, they're being fed the corn feed and things like that that are genetically modified. So all of those animals assimilate all of that into their, their bodies, their DNA, you know, the, the meats that everybody eats. Um, so coffee, I didn't, I, I'd have to look up coffee. That would, that's interesting. But as far as plants go, basically anything made with corn, anything made with sugar that's not 100% cane sugar, anything made with soy, canola, like I was looking up like soy le leth, oh, that's such a hard word to say, like soy leth, lethicin or something like that. Yeah. Um, but the, it's all on the list. But basically what they've done is they've created a lot of different crops to make them herbicide and pest resistant. There's like a glyco phosphate or something like that, that um, they want to be able to add to the crops because if they make the plants pesticide and herbicide resistant, then farmers can just do like a one-stop shop and they can spray everything instead of worrying about the weeds versus the crops and things like that. Um, they also um, try to like use things to like reduce disease. Like you probably, everybody's probably heard about like golden rice and bananas. Um, like bananas with the polio vaccine, golden rice with like the vitamin A and things like that in it, um, which is a whole separate interesting issue. But um, they also try to like reduce spoiling. Um, let's see, looking at my notes here, all kinds of different things with that stuff. They also try to like, I'm kind of creeped out by like milk at this point, basically after doing a lot of the reading I've done today. 
they actually use, um, they take cows and they, it, they put um, tissue from human mammary glands in them so that the um, milk is more um, like tolerable in the human digestive system and so that the cows produce more milk. So um, that's a whole different issue also. So basically, what are the big issues here? Um, you, the thing is that it's a slippery slope because when you start talking about GMOs, like the first thing you can talk about is like from a health perspective, like inherently, you can't find any independent studies done out there because they're so crazy expensive to do. So most of the studies are backed by the biotech companies. And um, it's interesting because actually after teaching about this one year, a bunch of my students took their cell phones to lunch and tried calling Monsanto. It was actually, it was pretty hilarious, but they won't answer calls, field emails, nothing like that. That's the big like BT corn maker. Um, they actually own a lot of the factory farm seeds that are used now things like that, like the crops. Um, so there's factory farming of animals, what we feed the animals, all those different issues. There's increased use of pesticides on plants and the effect that has on everybody. There's um, the government subsidizes the biotech companies. That's a big deal. Um, the biotech companies aren't transparent. Um, label law inconsistency. This is a big one that I learned about from my next door neighbor. We don't have any federal mandates about label laws. Um, so every state has different regulations for what belongs on a label. Um, some states have more rigid label laws. Like I know Vermont wants a more rigid label law. Like they wanted like every ingredient listed and whether it's GMO free or not on the label. Some states don't want to include the label. And there's also, there are no standards, like if, if a product is labeled as non-GMO, there's no standard that dictates what that has to be to call it a non-GMO. So um, like for example, tonight, my family uses um, Earth Balance, like a coconut oil butter spread. And it says non-GMO on it, but when I flipped to the back and read the ingredients, the bulk of the ingredients are on that list of most commonly GMO um, you know, ingredients. So I went to their website and they say they're sustainable and all these things, but they don't actually indicate how they keep their farms GMO free. So that would be an interesting thing. You'd really have to call the company and ask them that question because what happens is um, the farms that try to stay GMO free, if there's any kind of farm nearby that's a factory farm, or using biotech seeds, then just because of natural cross-pollination, they actually start to take in the DNA of the GMO seeds. And then the unfortunate thing is that um, representatives from Monsanto drive around and they, they genetically test the crops and they'll genetically test the crops of nearby farmers that aren't buying their seeds. And if anything shows up in the the DNA of those seeds, they slap those farmers with really heavy fines. So there's a lot of politics, there's a lot of really crazy stuff going on, but unless you can prevent like wind dispersal, normal natural pollination, there's no way to prevent, because so many of, you know, like for example, if you think about like 94% of the corn in America, um, most of it is made by, Mon the seeds are made by Monsanto, the farmers have to buy the new seeds every single year and then Monsanto will do all the genetic testing to make sure and they'll follow up on all of these things. So um, yeah, I guess that's, you know, just to add to that, there's also ecosystem issues with like, once they start making crops that are pesticide and herbicide resistant, it also makes the um, weeds become more tolerant. So for example, they're saying that like ragweed and things like that are more hardy. And so allergies are getting worse because those plants are evolving right next to the seed production and things like that. And then there's also been like GMO salmon that's accidentally been released into the ocean and now it's breeding with the natural salmon populations. Um, so those are all the things. 
So when you talk to someone that, um, so what should we do? I guess that's the big question. Um, I, I, from what I understand in places like California, they're able to, because they have so much access to like fresh fruits and vegetables year round. I know that like, I listened to a podcast of their, like with Darren Olean in it. He actually lives in like a little compound that he like limits. And then he like sneaks his own seeds back into the country and like raises them on his property and like perfectly controls how they're raised and things like that. But, um, so he's, he's pretty cool guy, but here in, here in Ohio, we have like, we have all of this, you know, farming and everything like that. So we really don't have a lot of access to like legitimate GMO free. I do. Yeah. <laughs> He's so cool. But, um, so, um, I do. Yeah. Honesty hour. <laughs> but, um, so here in Ohio, we would be hard pressed to find legitimately GMO free products. So for us to go and say, like, this has no GMOs, um, we have to, I think we have to be really careful about, like, you know, I'm thinking about the clients that I have and they, they want things to be easy. They wanna walk into the grocery store. They wanna know that if they pick up some broccoli, that it's good for them. And so when you get into the discussion of like, well, this may or may not be a GMO and things like that, it's really hard to say. So honestly, as long as like most processed foods are GMO made. So if you can get people to avoid sugar, get people to avoid processed foods, get them to avoid vegetable oils, canola oil, thing like, things like that, then they're losing most of the GMOs from their diet. And then when it gets into like, the fruits and vegetables and things like that, they're not labeled, they're not mandated to be labeled, nobody's required to prove it. You know, it's really hard to steer people clear of certain things like that. So um, I guess thinking about the ladies I've been helping, it would be important to keep it simple for them and keep it clear and try to avoid a lot of the like the politics and all of those extra things. You know, unless you had someone dirty dozen. Here's the thing that a lot of people don't know. Organic and GMO are totally separate. So if you have an organic farm, an organic farm can use GMOs and still be USDA certified organic because they can use that are GMO seeds and still not apply the farming practices that go along with all of the things with organic. So that's the hard thing to understand. So a lot of people think that the USDA certified organic and GMO free is one and the same, but it's really not. So a lot of the organic farms do use GMO seeds. So for example, if you used, um, if you used a corn that was genetically engineered to be pesticide resistant, you could still use that on a GMO farm um, it's not likely you could because oftentimes when they make the farmers buy that, that corn seed, they make them also buy the pesticides with it. But um, there are certain things that you could buy genetically modified seed and raise them organically. So it's like, I just, I guess, I don't know if that made everybody more aware, like better, worse, whatever, but I guess with getting involved in those conversations, it's like, it's really tough to handle. Sorry, bedtime. But um, so is there, I guess, is there anything I can help with? Or personally, I mean, in a perfect world, I guess what I personally, like I don't eat animal, prop, like a lot of animal meat, things like that, because I feel strongly about those kinds of things, like the hormones and antibiotics and stuff like that. Chemically, it's better for you. I try to buy the clean 15 and avoid the dirty dozen when I can. Um, it's not perfect in the grocery stores. Um, you know, it's, it's just such a hard thing with the things that we have access to. Um, so I guess, is there anything I can help with? Well, I think, I think it was very helpful to hear and the, the more we study this, the more you hear things over and over again, like it, it starts to sink in a little bit more. 
even I think having the knowledge base of and the confidence to say when you get a question, you know, from someone, you know what, that is a really complicated subject. And this is what I do for my family. And this is what I recommend. You really do need to avoid processed foods, avoid the vegetable oils, um, avoid the sugar. It, it, it's not anything different than, you know, we right. say gluten, dairy, and soy tend to be inflammatory foods. It's not harming anybody to recommend that they avoid those things. Same, same kind of thing here. If you just give them the, the basic information, you, you're not going to be, you're not going to feel like you're guiding them wrong, nor do right. we want to get in a, an argument. <laughs> right. Yeah. I think if you just say avoid, of, you know, avoid those things that we all like to avoid, avoid the processed foods, avoid all those different things. And then if you have someone that's really passionate about GMOs, then you can direct, it's even hard to find unbiased, like reputable sites about it. It's, that's why like nothing I've given you has like sources because you have to kind of use your like scientific prowess to sort through like the bias and all of that stuff, either one way or, or the other. So it's just, it's, it's, so I think if you had someone want to know more, you could say, you know, that's a really great question and say, you know, I, I would encourage you to call some of these companies, you know, really just get on the phone and call them. And mm -hmm. then, um, and then if, you know, if they won't answer your call or answer your questions, that speaks for itself is what mm -hmm. I've learned. Okay. And that, yeah, for the most part, if you're avoiding all those things, then you're staying pretty clean for the most part. That was really good, Jamie. Thank you. I think the clarification too with the organic in the GMO, mm -hmm. because I use that eat cleaner spray. I don't know if any, do you use that Charisse eat cleaner? Have you heard of that, Jamie? I have. Yeah. I know Shalene Johnson. Yeah. Says that's a really great thing to use. Yeah. But I guess that is only really taking care of the organic piece of it. Right. I mean, it's not going to do anything for the, right. the right. GMO. No. Okay. The other one that I think is so hard and all of our people are eating them is nuts. Yes. Nuts are one of the worst crops. And then they put the vegetable oils on it. So like right now I barely buy nuts, but I love, I love them. I want my kids to have them. One, they're expensive. Right. And two, if you, there was one brand I found at target, it was like in a blue bag it was in Florida mm -hmm. and it had, um, it didn't have the canola oil or the peanut oil or the cottonseed oil but it is almost impossible. Do you guys have any places that you buy them? Do you ever look at the oils on there? So I, I actually use a lot of nuts in my diet because I am vegetarian. I mean, not excessively, but I do eat my standard portion of nuts each day. Yeah. I buy raw, organic, you know, I read the labels. I make sure, you know, like my peanut butter is only like peanuts and salt. Yeah. You know, I mean, and that doesn't handle the GMO part of it, but at right. least there's not the extra added oils and, you know, things like that. But it's, that's, yeah. all you I, I wish we could find somewhere to, because even Thrive, they're just a fortune. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, you just you can't get them cheaper if they don't have a bad oil on them. And, I mean, the raw ones, yeah, I just can't get the kids to eat them raw usually. So, How's yeah. that look, Sharice? You can unmute yourself, Sharice. It's just the four of us. No, I just muted because they're watching TV in here. Oh. Um, these are Southern Southern Grove. Um, Wait, let me see that, Sharice. Where did you get those? All these, and there's no oil in them. It's just almonds and sea salt, and my kids eat them. Oh. Yeah. So, I have to check our bag because we get our almonds from... DJs. But then again, out. if they don't say organic, they don't, and it, and it doesn't take care of the yeah. GMO part either. Yeah. But at least, but at the, least oil. If the oil is not on there. It's less GMO, right. I guess. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> That's All right. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well. Okay. 
Well, no, I think that was very good. And of course, anybody that has questions on um, watching the replay can ask. Jamie will be our resident um, <laughs> scientist. No, person now. No, that was good. Oh, the PDFs that you shared with me, I can upload them into the file section of our lips page. That way we can print them out and put them in our in our in our resources and um, I wouldn't recommend sharing those like I mean amongst our team yes but I wouldn't like send them out to a client or something like that like I would feel bad about sending it out and not being able to tell them okay like exactly you know because I did look at a couple of like um, you know I looked at a couple of websites from different like you know yeah both sides, but I really don't feel like I could give you a 100% reputable scientific site on that. Okay. I mean, I just know from a scientific perspective, like how to do it, how it's done. Um, you know, and you could find that, but as far as, you know, the benefits or adverse effects and things like that, but oh, I just wanted to add because a lot of like people that are very like pro use of GMO. They talk about the golden rice. They talk about the bananas with polio and things like that. The, the golden rice was created for, um, I forget which country, but they use the kind of rice that we eat here, not the kind of rice that they consider um, part of their culturally acceptable rice. So the people that they made that rice for, they won't even use it because they don't like that style of rice oh my God. and the bananas that are supposed to prevent polio the countries that eat the bananas that they made them for their bananas are not like our bananas and they made them like our bananas but then um the bananas they eat are more like a plantain so they're not exactly like they don't really improve any food security issues or things like that for them because they don't want that type of food so didn't feel the need it was just a little side note i thought i'd add that yeah. if people ask but okay cool well i didn't know i didn't actually know kind of all the good stuff that it did do you know like lots of medications i got a dad on insulin so that's good yeah, right? yeah. they're actually doing a lot with like there's going to be a lot of stuff coming here soon with a type of genetic engineering called crispr and it could be like the holy grail for a lot of different diseases and things like that so okay cool yeah well anybody anything else Allie? I don't, I don't think so okay thank you guys and we'll um get, a, get on over to Allie's and then we'll um, watch for the changes coming down the pike so all right you guys have a good night thanks for getting on all right thank you. Bye. 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 thanks Jamie